So I'm giving a speech today on everything is MEV. Why is MEV the most important design consideration in blockchain? Why is everything MEV? So today I'm going to elucidate my thesis for why MEV is the most significant property we should consider when reasoning about decentralized infrastructure. I'll begin with a brief introduction to my mental model of MEV as a property. Then I'll talk about how first principles thinking around MEV ties into all of the major blockchain verticals. Finally, I'll give some approaches to MEV awareness in protocol design and business strategy. So MEV is a property of consensus. To have a cogent discussion about MEV, we first have to answer what MEV is at the most fundamental level. There are many definitions for MEV which make sense in various contexts. Sometimes you want a definition that lets you quantify things or a definition that you can argue in a rigorous mathematical sense. However, my mental model for MEV is quite a simple and broad one, which I believe presents the best foundation for thinking about protocol design. MEV is any financial reward which incentivizes the consensus of a blockchain to continue progressing. In other words, if a blockchain is walking forwards, MEV is the reason why. So this includes the block reward, rewards from block building strategies, gas fees, internalized protocol rewards such as chain link tokens, and a whole host of other things. Why is this definition superior to other definitions? Well, it lets us think about the totality of what's going on in the interactions of many blockchain protocols from a game theoretic perspective. MEV surrounds us. So anyone who knows me on a personal level knows I like soft topics, like talking about my feelings, relationships, and, and codependency. And few relationships are more codependent than the relationship between a protocol designer and MEV. Whether you like it or not, MEV is something you contend with, and it's up to you if the relationship is a healthy one rather than a toxic one, because you can't ever break up. I'll cover some examples of common verticals where I believe that MEV awareness is crucial. So blockchains and L1, this is kind of the obvious example. MEV is the reward for progressing consensus, typically extracted by miners or validators in the form of block rewards and gas fees. Additional value from protocols can also be extracted by whoever is ultimately building the block. Misaligned incentives leads to centralization because there can be increasing returns to scale. Trading. It's like another obvious example. Sophisticated teams compete using different edges to capture value which protocols are leaving on the table each block. This is usually atomic or non-atomic arbitrage and sandwiching opportunities. But of course, there's an insane amount of other potential strategies. Misaligned incentives here usually leads to the entrenchment of one to two trading teams, which is kind of what we see on Ethereum today. But builders and relays. Building is essentially just another trading strategy, although it's kind of unique in the business and product development that's required to source general order flow and achieve MEV coverage for the strategies which are not executed in-house. So relays are a marketplace for block space, which takes block space from validators and coordinates market makers to settle it. I see the relay market as a key shelling point for MEV activity over the next two to five years, as relays gradually become interchained. Misaligned incentives here have some of the worst potential of any vertical to create massive centralization. So DEXs, this vertical is a key source of extracted MEV because price discovery tends to occur off chain and there's a block time lag, which leads to arbitrage profits. One of the most important open questions in the market is the best way to internalize this MEV to the liquidity providers or to the users. And whether batch auctions, dynamic fees, better Oracle pricing, or active liquidity is the best mechanism to reduce LVR, loss first rebalancing. There's also a lot of open questions about what's a fair split for the MEV between the users and between the liquidity providers. Bridges and interoperability protocols. So anytime consensus is being settled across multiple domains, you have a host of MEV considerations. Who has the control over finality? What cross-chain opportunities can be executed atomically? For example, having a validator execute on two chains simultaneously means that a cross-chain opportunity could become atomic. Misaligned incentives here leads to centralization of stake because there's network effects. Wallets and RPC providers. So wallets control the users who are generally quite sticky and they're reluctant to move elsewhere because there's a high degree of trust required for a wallet. And user transactions are responsible for the vast majority of MEV creation. And thus wallets are one of the key power brokers in the transaction supply chain. And misaligned incentives here will lead to users getting suboptimal execution. Order flow auctions. So you could argue these are part of a wallet's functionality or that they're directly underneath the wallet on the vertical. There's a lot of MEV considerations in how we solve intents and distribute value for order flow. 
I personally think it's a very complex picture because some of the value in order flow only exists in batches. For example, one approval transaction means nothing to me, but a thousand approval transactions is probably a strong buy or a sell signal. There are also questions about how we price the value of order flow between the users and liquidity providers in an open market, similar to the considerations in DEX design. Intent protocols. So intents have a lot of interesting considerations in respect to solving them effectively. I hold a contrarian belief that a lot of the design being done right now with intents is in, a, in the wrong direction because we're focused too much on expanding the complexity in which we can express the intents rather than focusing on the best ways to solve them. I believe an important MEV consideration is how we can create some kind of Lego building block for intents that appropriately constrains, constrains the expression so that we can appropriately constrain the, the solving. Oracles. Significant price updates from oracles creates a lot of value from liquidations and other types of MEV. Who should get this value? Can we design the oracle update mechanism so the MEV is internalized? Is this even a good idea? Or should the protocol try to absorb it somehow? I think this is a very interesting design space because you actually need oracle MEV to incentivize liquidators to protect your protocol from bad debt. Staking and restaking. This is again interesting because it blends MEV considerations with tokenomics, as the MEV rewards can become part of the staking rewards, which can accrue to tokens, or you can even split off the MEV rewards into a second token altogether. There's also a lot of MEV considerations with restaking, when validators can run arbitrary code and can get slashed like on Eigenlayer. Finally, stable coins. This is a really interesting case because MEV is responsible for the stability and the instability of stable coins. Typical stabilization mechanisms rely on people arbitraging away dislocations. And the typical collapse of a stable coin in a death spiral involves huge amounts of MEV extraction, like we saw in the case with Luna. The entire design space of stable coins is about harnessing positive MEV activity for the benefit of the protocol and reducing the effects of toxic activity. So designing infrastructure that's MEV aware, how do we develop a healthy relationship with MEV? There's a famous saying in economics, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcomes. And this applies aptly to protocol design. Designing protocols which are MEV aware means creating incentives which foster the outcomes that you desire. I'll run through some of my mental models for thinking about designing protocols in different verticals. So first I would start with macro analysis. What are the mental models? What is the supply chain? For any kind of decentralized commodity, where does it start and where does it end? For example, block space is a digital commodity. The market starts with intents or preferences over state transitions, as well as physical block space. These commodities flow down through wallets, RPCs, towards the marketplace for block space, which we currently call a relay. Validators on multiple chains sell their block space to the relays, who offer it to solvers, which may be builders or searchers. By visualizing the flows through the supply chain, you can start to build a picture of the vertical. What are the barriers to entry? What do people need to enter the market? Who can stop you from entering and why? Does it cost money? Whose permission do you need? What are the edges? So the typical edge in MEV is capital. For example, to be a CeFi DeFi trader on Ethereum right now, you need significant capital in order to bid away entire Binance dislocations across multiple pools. This leads to only a small group of well-capitalized searches dominating the market. Another edge is engineering, which of course relates closely to capital. This could be the quality of the engineering, for example, building low latency systems, or it could just be the general moat of having done a lot of engineering. Alpha is the, edge, is the edge of having some kind of insight into the market, which other people don't have. While this sounds pretty cool, it's actually the rarest edge to have, as the market is quite transparent. However, some people do have an alpha edge. Jane Street, for example, was running Manta Builder for a while, and you could see they were hedging a lot earlier than other people. Why were they doing this? Obviously, they had some kind of insight into likely future prices, which other people didn't have, meaning that if the price went up, they could hedge in advance knowing that it was likely to be a good trade and they would be more competitive for it. Business development is the final edge, and unfortunately, it's quite common. Teams strike deals with validator operators for access to stake, for order flow, unique access to protocols, giving them an advantage over competition. So understanding these edges is the key to understanding how the market is likely to progress. Who has the power to commoditize? There's a principle in business that you should always commoditize your complementaries. Essentially, this means that if you sit next to someone on the vertical, you should figure out how to increase their competition and drive their profits to zero. A classic example would be how the original Flashbots auction commoditized atomic searching. Atomic searches are complementary to the Flashbots auction because they're submitting bundles to the auction. If atomic searches gain too much power, then they could launch a competing product to Flashbots or just bypass Flashbots altogether. 
However, the flash floods auction had the effect of commoditizing atomic searching by encouraging competition, driving profits to near zero and leaving them unable to control the vertical. Right now, we see the order flow and capital are still distinct edges in the building and searching market, which are yet to be commoditized, leading, of course, to the centralization that we see today on Ethereum. In my opinion, the most interesting use case of Suave is its potential to commoditize the capital and order flow edges. Lastly, what are the dependencies? Distribution is always about dependencies. When you're in the middle layer of the vertical, you can't pay for Google advertisement. So whose permission do you need to grow? Are they motivated to help you? Are they likely to try and commoditize you or launch a competing product themselves? Are you actually solving any problems for your dependencies? This is a key issue in blockchain more broadly, where a lot of people are just building with no consideration to whether people would actually use their product. They just care about cool game theory. The microanalysis, the game theory and the mechanism design. So for this type of analysis, we look at the protocol in the context of the game theory and the mechanism design. Because at the end of the day, all blockchain protocols are just different types of repeated games. In other words, there are players, rules, incentives, strategies, and resulting equilibriums. Who are the players? Typical players in blockchain games include searchers, solvers, builders, market makers, users, protocols, relays, validators. Anyone who participates in any way is a player in the game. What are the rules of the game? It's common for these rules to be defined in code, such as smart contract code or client code. However, these may also be defined socially. And you might be surprised in MEV how loosely some of these rules can be defined. For example, some time ago it turned out on Phantom Network that reorganizing the entire blockchain was just a social rule, and no one would actually slash you if you did that. Many of the rules around propagating mempools are also just socially enforced. It's very important in analyzing the protocol to make a distinction between the rules you have to follow and the rules that you are supposed to follow. What are the incentives? Rules are enforced using various financial incentives, and you get rewarded by doing one thing or punished for doing another thing. It's important to quantify what the incentives are and how they compare against the opportunity cost. For example, if the incentive of a MEV opportunity is higher than the cost of getting slashed, then does it make sense to just get slashed? Strategies and, equili strategies and equilibriums. Whenever you have incentives and rules, you have resulting strategies and equilibriums. Often the strategies may be different to what you think. It's generally most helpful to look first for the dominant strategy, which is the strategy that results in the highest expected value, regardless of what anyone else does. In the classic prisoner's dilemma game, for example, the dominant strategy is to be a snitch. On Polygon, it might be to submit as much spam as humanely possible. The two common types of equilibriums that we find in markets are dominant strategy equilibriums and Nash equilibriums. A dominant strategy equilibrium is the outcome we get when everyone plays a dominant strategy, and a Nash equilibrium is a situation where it doesn't make sense for anyone to change their strategy. Creating good games. So how do we actually design good MEV games from the ground up? I'll offer some of the first principles thinking that I believe is worth following. One, reward the behavior you need to happen. If you want people to do something, create an incentive. If you don't want people to do something, punish them. Don't rely on social consensus, because lots of people aren't going to care and will do it anyway, especially when there is money at stake. Two, play to people's strengths. Give players in games jobs which they are actually good at. For example, solvers are professionals at taking and pricing risk. So they are the people who should be taking the risk in Meverware designs. A great example of this is the Across Bridge, which uses solvers to outsource the risk of finality. Two, there will always be edges and moats, so choose those edges wisely. You cannot create a game with no edges, so use the edges that serve your purpose. Think about what kind of barriers to entry these edges will create. Three, don't assume everyone is nice. Don't be stupid about people's incentives, basically. People will do B2B work with each other, hackers will come along, searchers will try and exploit you. Think about timing. This is actually a common misalignment between founders and VCs. VCs often have a different perspective of where the timing in the market is, and founders often exploit this in order to raise capital. So you need to think when you're building about what the market will be like in six months' time or when you launch your product, not what it's like right now. Think about where the MEV, who creates the MEV and where it should go. So MEV has to go somewhere, so think carefully about where it should go. Maybe you want to run a batch auction and internalize it to users. Maybe you want to give it to liquidators to protect your protocol from bad debt. Maybe you want to give it to validators, the protocol itself, or some other party altogether. This is often a philosophical choice, not just an economic one, as there's many competing definitions of fairness. Lastly, what are the optics to the market and also to regulators? Lastly, think about the optics. Is your protocol going to protect sandwiching and piss off regulators? 
Is your token going to make you look like a Ponzi to the people on ETH Research Forum? Bad optics can quickly destroy your project, even if your execution and everything else is basically perfect. Okay, so to wrap things up, I hope I've managed to present a different perspective here on MEV and convince you that we need to abandon pretenses like solving or eliminating MEV. MEV is a fundamental property of blockchain, and it's up to us to harness it for good or evil. It can be democratized, it can be distributed, it can be internalized, but it cannot be destroyed. MEV is not good or evil, it's a neutral incentive. It's the most important incentive in designing decentralized protocols. Because blockchains are just games, and MEV is what keeps the score. MEV is everywhere, and everything is MEV. Thank you.